thrust into this city of, you know, like 30,000 people. That, that was overwhelming for me. It, that sounds crazy. But think about it. Country bumpkin kid coming into a sophisticated college and want to study music and want to play basketball. Yeah, yeah, for, for, for real. Um, well, I walked on the basketball team, made the team, and then, because I wanted to major in music, because, you know, everyone's telling me that's a gift from the Lord, you need to pursue it, I found myself in this uh, very lonely place, <laughs> because most of the kids I was up against in the music school, not that we were in competition, but just that I had never had music lessons in my life. I didn't know how to read music, and all of a sudden, I'm thrust into this situation where, because I could hear things very well musically. They put me in the top theory class. Well, if you don't understand even how to read music, it's like you might as well have been planted in Moscow, Russia as an American who's n never learned one word of Russian. That's how I felt. To, on top of that, to be a music major during those days, you had to be part of a choral group every semester. Well, how do you get to be a part of a choral group? Well, you audition. Here's how my audition went. Mr. Jernigan, would you take that choral octavo, go to the third page and to the second score, and would you read the alto line in your register? And I'm like, um, I don't even know what you just said. <laughs> you might as well be speaking Russian. Needless to say, I didn't make any of the singing groups. Uh, quit the basketball team because I thought, there's no way I can play basketball. I've got, I've, I just got to really work hard just to survive in the music school. But, you know, never fear that choral group thing. They had a special group, a special group for guys like me called the Shawnee Choral Society. It was like remedial choral group 101. It was humiliating. And honestly, this is how I felt. You know, the, the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer claymation thing we see every Christmas and the Island of Misfit Toys. That's what I honestly felt like. In fact, I called it the Island of Misfit Toys, <laughs> the Shawnee Choral Society. But at the same time, I decided I'm going to do, I'll show everybody. I'm going to work my butt off. And by the time I'm a senior, I'll show them all. Well, uh, you know, here we are, Oklahoma Baptist University. It's a Christian school. Uh, somebody one day introduced me to this thing called contemporary Christian music. I had never heard of such a thing. In fact, the only music I'd ever heard, the most contemporary Christian music I heard was the hymns or... Uh, Grandpa Jones Southern Gospel Quartet on Hee Haw. And, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I was pretty cool because I had Elvis Presley's hymns album. Now, contemporary Christian music, though, uh, man, it was an amazing thing. Here, all of a sudden, were people singing songs they had written about the Lord themselves. They weren't in the hymnal. They had written these songs from their own experiences. And that blew my mind. In fact, uh, one guy that just had started out this was 1977, my, the fall of my freshman year. This guy named Keith Green came to our campus. And, man, if you ever saw Keith, first of all, he looked like John the Baptist had come back. <laughs> in fact, it's just him and a piano sitting on that stage, only about 200 people in the audience. And here's this guy, and he's, he's a maniac. I'm looking for the locust and wild honey, John the Baptist. He's back. And uh, he began to sing. I find it hard to believe someone like you get for me. You put this love in my heart. Is all this real or a dream? I feel so glad I can scream. You put this love in my heart. This dude began to sing these songs, and they weren't just about God, but he was singing to the Lord. I, I had never seen anything like it. it blew my mind. And he had me right there because he began to tell his story, how he'd tried all these different religions, how he had tried drugs, he had tried all these different things to satisfy the deepest longings of his soul, and none of them did. And then he said, Jesus found me. I was blown away. Two things about Keith that really impacted me greatly. His intimacy with the Lord. In fact, he began to sing to the Lord, and it was like, two best friends in a deep, intimate conversation, and you're thinking, man, uh, should I even be listening to this? But the effect, and it was awesome, it was holy, drew you right into the midst of their conversation. So it was like you were right there with the Lord and with Keith. It was awesome. 
the other thing about Keith was that his passion for others to know Jesus was so evident. I thought, he was in my league of sin. If everything he's saying about himself is true, and God, you could do that for Keith. Could you maybe do that for me? And so the music of Keith Green was very instrumental in just keeping me sane, keeping me alive. That same year, my freshman year, somebody handed me an album uh, by this group, this Christian rock band called Second Chapter of Acts. And there was this song, you remember the song? Hear the bells ringing, they're singing that we can be born again. Well, first of all, uh, a record album, somebody hand me this record. A record is like a giant CD for you young people out there. Uh, but it's actually cooler because you can play it on both sides. Anyway, um, on this record were all these amazing songs. Again, not out of some hymnal, but written out of this lady's own experience. Annie Herring, raised in North Dakota, Catholic girl, went to Southern California to make it in the music business, I believe signed by CBS Records on the path to becoming the next Janis Joplin. Got very involved in the drug scene. In fact, had two babies before she was married. Gave them up for adoption. And, uh, and the reason I'm even sharing with you her story is because her music was had such a great impact on me on a couple of levels. It was intimate, it was honest, but it was also born out of her own experience that, uh, to me, seemed pretty messed up. Yet God had fixed her, had redeemed her. I thought, again, if you can do it for Keith, you can do it for Annie Herring, then maybe you can do it for me. Uh, her husband, Buck Herring, was born again, came to know the Lord 